All right, we are live. We are going to give it a few minutes here and let people join us. <laughs> That's great, John. We're, work out those facial muscles. Let's get ready. <laughs> <laughs> hello, hello to everyone. We are live on Facebook and LinkedIn, so feel free to share this and have your friends join us for this evening. We will give it a few more minutes here. We know it's a Monday, but here in Indiana, it is bright and sunny, so it's a good Monday. <laughs> we'll take that. USABA's right. on. Woo! Hello, United States Association of Blind Athletes. That's great. Thank you for joining us. All right. Well, while we wait for a few more people to join us and uh, let everyone get settled, I'm going to give everyone a little bit of background on um, our evening tonight and how we've come here before we jump in with our featured conversation. Um, but tonight's Conversations with Turnstone is stemming from our First People Conversations um, campaign, which is um, the extension of our 2021 First People campaign that we shared in celebration of Disability Awareness Month. So last March, we launched this conversation really just encouraging people to understand that we truly are people first, regardless of what differences we may or may not see in one another. And this year, we decided to take that conversation and really spotlight one-on-one -on -one conversations with people from our own community who have disabilities and just exploring what their lives look like, what community looks like to them, um, and taking the time to learn because that's that's where we really come to the point of being able to um, respect one another, appreciate one another, and, and join with one another. So uh, this year's campaign sheds a lot more light on community inclusivity and diversity. Throughout the whole month of March, we've shared profiles on community members Tom, Cliff, Lisa and Tina. Um, each conversation has been highlighting a different topic. And so if you missed those conversations or want to catch those conversations again, we do have them shared on our website, which is turnstone.org forward slash first people. That was turnstone.org slash first people. Um, and we'll have those up so you'll be able to go grab those when you're done watching tonight's conversation. Um, and really, we've just wanted to take those conversations and give people insight into how we can all take the first step or the next step in creating more diverse communities, stronger communities by listening to and respecting people's stories that might be different than our own. So tonight we're capping off those conversations and closing out Disability Awareness Month with, with a really exciting live conversation. Um, so I'm just excited to introduce you to our featured community member and we are taking community to a much broader scale tonight featuring um, John Register coming to us from Colorado Springs, Colorado. Um, our conversation tonight is uh, really featuring who we have become to know as an overcomer who makes global impacts. And we're just so grateful that he found time in the schedule tonight um, to, to get down to the real with us. Um, he's a combi combat army veteran, a four-time track and field All-American, and a two-time Olympic trials qualifier. However, one misstep in life cost him his leg and ended both his Olympic dreams and military career. But you will realize that that did not stop him. Um, since his injury, he won the long jump silver medal in Sydney, Australia, has advised four U.S. secretaries of state, and founded the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee's Paralympic Military Sport Program, um, which continues to help wounded, ill, and injured service members um, using sport as a tool for their rehab. And in addition to his impressive resume, we're also very proud to have John as a member of Turnstone's Olympic and Paralympic Training Site Advisory Committee. So he's investing in the Paralympic Paralympic movement at all levels, um, including right here in Fort Wayne, Indiana, Northeast Indiana. Um, so tonight we're going to dive into a great conversation, um, explore the topics of disability awareness and inclusion, 
how we can make our community stronger. And then uh, hopefully we'll have some time to answer some questions um, from those of you who are joining us. If you'd like to submit a question tonight, uh, feel free to drop a comment and we'll be compiling those as we go. Um, and thank you again, everybody for joining us. And thank you to those of us who, or those of you who are watching the recording, because we will be sharing this um, after we're done here. So um, with that, thank you so much for joining us, John. Stasha, happy to be here with you. Love Turnstone. The work you're doing is just off the charts. I'm watching everybody come on. We got Tina on. We have USA Blind Soccer's on. We have United States Association of Blind Athletes. I'm looking at all this. I can't make comments to them, but I can see you all. What's going on, family? All right. I love it. Love it. Love it. Uh, well, speaking of family, can you share a little bit more about your story and um, how you've come to joining us? this evening. Yeah. So for those that don't know, uh, I was a world-class athlete and ran for the University of Arkansas. We just lost at Duke. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, I was a world-class athlete, four-time All-American at the University of Arkansas. And after I graduated, I wound up uh, enlisting in the United States Army and uh, won nine Army competition gold medals in different various sports disciplines in track and field and also served in operation desert shield desert storm i really enjoyed my time in service and i took the officer selection battery test wound up getting a selection date for officer candidate school but at the same time i was trying to you know continue fulfill my dreams of becoming an olympian so i was on the army's world-class athlete program team in 1994 I was going across. I was ranked as high as the eighth fastest hurdler in the country, and I misstepped a hurdle. I dislocated my left knee. I severed the artery behind the kneecap. Seven days later, I became an amputee. So I went thrust from this world of going into Olympic stardom and being on the team and officer candidate school, being a lifer in the military, to now trying to figure out what does life even look like. And as I was going down the downward spiral, my wife, Alice, she kind of comes running over to me and kind of asks me what's wrong, why, why, what's going on in my head. And I began to articulate to her all my fears. So fears of who am I? What's my identity? Are you going to still stay with me? Is my, my son still going to see me as his dad? Do I still have a job in the military? Can I support you all? I mean, what is, what's going to happen to me now? So all these fears that were coming in for me from different places of society and other people were really driving my countenance in the downward spiral. And she says the words that stops my downward spiral. You know what, John, we're going to get through this together. It's just our new normal. And with those words, I began to elevate again and began to process that, you know, the terms we use right now with this new normal, it's not a destination at all. It's only a plateau by which we grow. So I began growing in this way. I did intern my service in the military. Uh, I started working for the United States Army in the Army World Class Athlete Program as a civilian, helping other athletes achieve their goals to try to make the Olympic Games. At the parallel time, I found the parallel games, the Paralympic Games, and I started swimming for physical therapy. And lo and behold, just 26, 27 months later, I made the Paralympic swim team. I saw athletes running and jumping on artificial legs at those games in Atlanta, Georgia, and wound up having an artificial leg made for running. Four years after that, I wound up winning the silver medal in the long jump in Sydney, Australia, becoming over one, becoming one of over uh, one of two amputees above the knee amputees to jump over um, 17 and a half feet without a leg or a knee. Uh, and we can talk a little bit about that too. It was from there I wound up um, going to the switching jobs and roles and working for the United States Olympic Committee and taking all that acumen, all this stuff that I learned in the military and beginning the Paralympic Military Sport Program, which was not my first idea. It was not my idea. I just was re -res I was resurrecting something of going back to our founders of Sir Ludwig Gutmann who did this for World War II veterans and why we're all involved in this sport, because he's the father, the grandfather of the Paralympic movement. <clears throat> so that was, we had a war going on. I just injected that same philosophy and began really ramping up a sport uh, <laughs> that was, it was a heavy lift because if you remember during that time, a lot of injuries were coming back off a of theater and America really doesn't know if they didn't know if they want to be in this Afghan war or not. 
And so they didn't, definitely didn't want, the military definitely didn't want injured service members being touted out there as, a, as celebratory of this war we were actually in. So it was a very heavy lift. It's easy now because everybody's like, oh, I want to help veterans. But it was very tough at that point to kind of get this off the ground. Um, but once it did get going, it kind of got some wheels for it, got some money for it from Congress. It turned into Warrior, uh, warrior Games. It turned into Prince Harry's Invictus Games. Uh, it's still going on, you know, not inside the United States Olympic Committee now. But uh, it is going on in other pockets around the, the community that we uh, we serve glo kind of globally. Um, so, yeah. So and so now working with Turnstone and, you know, Mike Mushet was trying to to build out the, the executive director was trying to build out programs for youth programs across the United States. I was working for Mike at, at, at the time at the United States Olympic Committee uh, with an, another strong team because we have a same a similar philosophy. If you don't build a pipeline, you can't get you can't. You can't get the, the the best cherries to get on top, right? So uh, cherry cherry pick is good until the cherries are all gone. Uh, so so that uh, so that's that's what that's what my whole focus has been is trying to build and trying to increase and still right now trying to increase the the platforms for for youth and young adults uh, with disabilities to to have access to sport in order to elevate their own lives and careers. Well, John, I think that is just a phenomenal segue into one of the things I wanted to talk with you tonight about, and that mm. is uh, the Paralympic Games that just closed. Yeah. Uh, you know, we saw all the news coverage. You know, has you know record-breaking years in a great way for the Paralympics, which is an interesting contrast to uh, the viewership of the Olympic Games, which was not as positive. Mm. Um, so, from your perspective, you know, watching those dynamics play out, watching the 2022 games. <coughs> out, what you know what's what's your state of the parallel what, I'm sorry. what's that perspective look like for you <coughs> i'm sorry i'm trying to get the, i'm oh, trying to find the mute button because i'm coughing <laughs> <laughs> my um my um take on paralympics is we're in a great growth spot right now and so i'm gonna hold on so i'm trying to get some I'm trying oh, to find yes. water yeah, i'm having no, water um <laughs> the um and i think we're in a great growth spot globally there uh we see some of the challenges and that are coming alongside parallel to our olympic counterparts so we have you know just as <clears throat> russia and belarus were kind of exited and not allowed to compete that allowed for some other opportunities for other athletes other nations other countries to to elevate inside the sport and so as we look at this from the, from the, I think, the standpoint of athleticism, I think we're on a great growth. I think we have some challenges uh, inside of Paralympics that are some threats to uh, the growth of, of the sport. And see, our, where are we in, in terms of that? I think one of the challenges that we see oftentimes that happens just before games is a classification that is either eliminated or uh, doesn't is not allowed to compete or shifts. Uh, and that's a challenge because it's hard to explain anyway what these classifications actually are for people in the media to know what it is to actually market it. And if we keep on shifting and changing it, what does that do not only for the marketability of the of the of the Paralympic Games, but also those that have been training for four to six years in this one thing that you said was going to be on the program, and now you just said, oh, it's not going to be on the program anymore. So we have to really look at from a longevity standpoint: uh, Are we? For far enough down the road where we have stability across the sports, the disciplines themselves, and for the athletes that are competing in those sports. We have to make that uh, that that parity there. And where do you think the <clears throat> biggest um, or maybe the most important area of improvement we really need to focus on would be? I mean, there, you made a great point. I mean, there's there's a beauty to the Paralympic movement, but there's mm -hmm. also this complexity. Um, and, yeah. and it is hard to explain to someone, even someone who's living it, um, let alone someone who is sort of outside of their their life experience. I mean, so there's a complexity, but where do we start? You know, where, where where's the most important next step? Well, I think the, the the biggest thing is when you look at the Paralympics as a whole, what what does it really help us understand? I mean, I I, I used to just loathe the word inspiration uh, because I don't want to become I don't want to be the I don't want to wind up on the human interest page story. I want to be on the sports section. I get that. the ch The challenge of this is that people will see an athlete compete. And it causes them to do something else in their life, 
to elevate some type of thing that's may, maybe have lying, has lied dormant. And when they see a Paralympian compete, they begin to take action. And I think that is the proper use of inspiration. We don't say with LeBron James or Mia Hamm, you know, kicking a soccer goal or, or LeBron James doing a massive dunk. My gosh, that was the most inspirational dunk or goal I've ever seen in my life. But if that inspired a kid to pick up a soccer ball or basketball and now they they have a, a, a thing they're going to do and they're going to practice over and over again, then that's an inspirational act because inspiration is a catalyst to motivation. Motivation in turn causes actions. Action lead us to transformational results. And so we see that, I, in my opinion, the Paralympic Games is a force multiplier. It's it's larger than the, the Olympic Games themselves because people identify with an individual that might be on that track or field or in the on the on the in the start gate uh, at the winter games and they see somebody in their own family that has a disability and says i didn't even know these things were possible how do i engage with this and it becomes a five to seven times multiplier of touch points that you can actually have when you look at the campaign that just happened the we the 15 campaign 15 percent of the world's population having a disability of those 15%, it equates to 1.2 billion people in the world. And of those 1.2 billion people, if we look at the Accenture report, we're talking almost $8 trillion of buying power. And yet we're saying, we can't find the money to support our teams. It's out there. It's there. All you got to do is show up for it. The challenge then becomes, as leaders, can we put ourselves in the mindset that actually wants to grow a talent pipeline have a pervasive demand to expand and elevate that pipeline? And does the entity impressed upon the change actually want the pipeline that's being that that that's there? And if we get all three of those things happening, it it's we're like the uh the the, the military program I, I built. It's like whoop, it 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 sails. If we're not, it, it will stagnate and we'll just start plugging and picking and just cherry picking people to try to, to be in it. We have a great opportunity. I think that's that's one piece of it. I think another piece of it is to, to show how infant we are is I just said in the introduction, after 26 months, 27 months of doing a new sport, swimming, I made a Paralympic team. That should not happen. I should not. Paralympics should be high enough level where I am not, I have, I'm forced to choose or I can't make a team just in 26 months, 27 months. I mean, I, I think that the athletes, some of the athletes that we have, like Oksana Masters, amazing kid. I mean, this, this woman, oh my gosh, I just, whoo, we bow, right? But if I think, and I, if I put this in the context, going back to LeBron or Mia Hamm, could they do two sports? Are there sports at, at a level high enough where it's going to be extremely difficult to do too, really difficult. I just don't think we're there yet with, with Paralympics. I think we, there's a lot more growth that we have to have happen so that athletes are more forced to choose. Again, I salute what Exana Masters does, right? Mm -hmm. Because she's like the the the, the, Bill, the Billy Thorpe, you know, um, of, of of the old days of of just of just crushing and doing multiple sports. We don't see it in football or baseball, right? We we've seen it very small with with a Bo Jackson. Um, um, do it, you know, but, but that they're, they're the anomalies. And I think we need to have more anomalies hit there than, than, than is actually the norm switching sports. Can, should I be able to do a wheelchair race from a hundred meters all the way to the marathon and dominate every one of those categories? Right. I think that we have to have more equity and parity. So therefore that goes in the leadership to begin to grow the pipelines so that we have this come out. And I think that's 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 I think is another issue that we have to to do. Uh, and then, of course, I said the third thing already, which was um, is to make it very palatable for those that are watching the sport to know exactly what they're watching and why. When I was running the hundred meter dash in in um, in Sydney, Australia, why was there a guy from the Ukraine there that had two legs? How do you explain that, right, to someone that's watching? Oh, everybody else in all eight lanes has one leg above the amputee, this guy has two, and he gets third place. How does that work, mm -hmm. right? It's too it's too much to, to try to decipher, and he's got polio and his arms don't work. It's, it's just too much to decipher. So we have to begin to really pare it down and measure apples and apples. The more, and the more we can do that, I think the, the greater our sport will become.
Yeah, we just had a question come in from LinkedIn um, asking how the U.S. Paralympic budget compares to the Olympic budget. Um, it, hmm. Do you have any I'm, insight I'm, there? Uh, I don't know. I think I think you know. I think one of the, the numbers I heard when I was there was it's about eighty-seven to thirteen yeah. percent. Um, but that could have changed by now. I don't know. Yeah. I, I've been there for a little while. Um, I think the the greater question is, you know, why in this time are are we getting equitable treatment? Is I think is is the is the question uh, yeah. of how are we advancing forward now? And so we can say that athletes are getting equitable treatment with inside the money that's coming in that are being generated for for medals, uh, as well as we're getting equitable treatment as as far as um, you know. Uh, uh, ethics committees and and the and the committees that we can serve on, and if we look at, at at the at the longevity of it. Right after sport, uh, we have the Olympic and Paralympians Association, which came before the the naming of the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee. So for 15 years, we we're trying to get that done, but all of a sudden, overnight, it happens. So I ask always ask myself the question, why? And so what was going on during that time? Well, we want it for 15 years or longer to have equity treatment with inside of that and equity of money. And we, we find out at the exact same time the Dr. Larry Nasser case is going on. Huh. And so there's a lot of heat happening in Congress that's that's putting the United States Olympic Committee underneath the bus, right? It's really not being it's not a great time. And so all of a sudden now we get a shift that happens to this equitable treatment. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying the timing is. It's interesting that it happens at this point in time. And of course, the athletes don't really know. They just know they're getting equitable treatment, maybe not being used as pawns to kind of per squelch, squelch pervasive demand. So we have to look at all these things because I think it's the right thing to do. Yeah. And I want to make sure that athletes are have fair and equitable treatment. And we're on those those boards. I just got a call from USA Track and Field um, a, a couple of days ago, and there's going to be a, a great meeting that's going to happen in Bahamas you know, for alumni. And, and at the first time they've included Paralympic athletes for that. That's amazing. That's great. Yeah. Um, and so I, so I, I think that's, that's, that is where we want that pervasive demand saying, yeah, we see this as equitable. And yes, my storyline kind of crosses both lines because I was a world-class athlete, Olympic trials person in that, in, 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 in the hurdles. And also I'm a, I'm a, I'm a medalist in the, in the Paralympic games. So, and I, and when they asked me, what's the difference? I said, there was no difference in training. I just, I had a, there was the, the mindset was still the same. I still right. wanted that thing. Right. But I, I also understand that I had to train a little bit different than I would have with my Olympic colleagues. Uh, so there is, there is that, that, that happens as well. I think your, your point that you're making in terms of pipeline development and just um, how we elevate the Paralympic yeah. movement and, and continue to grow it is a great um, example. If you want to take it as a micro to this, you know, as a, to the macro conversation of, of equality and equity and inclusion yeah. um, and, and just ties well um, into the conversations we're trying to have in that um, there are macro situations that need to be addressed. And, and, and there's many conversations going on in, in our society right now um, that need to continue. Uh, mm -hmm. But so much of the impact and the change has to start happening at the individual level and at the community level. And so, you know, yeah. as it relates to this conversation, you know, access to youth sports, and how do we how do we expose children to the broad array of sports, um, both adaptive and non-adaptive, to the point that you know as they grow, as they refine their strengths and their skills and their talents, you know everyone goes on the path that they're meant to. So that by the time we get to the Paralympics, it's not a novel concept; it just right. is. And we're just, to your point, celebrating the athleticism of, of each individual athlete first. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, there's these macro conversations, but there's differences we can make in making a difference in the movement now, here, you know, in the children that we're raising and that are around us, in the communities, in the schools. And um, I just think that's a, a great example of the domino effect of what we do today and how it impacts the bigger picture. Stasha, you're right. And, and you know, when I look at, you know, the folks that are on some of these folks, you know, with the United States Association of Blind Athletes, just take that, you know, you all do a great job uh, with the goalball team that's right there. Why can't that, why can't goalball be normalized inside of a school system? Right? For everybody. Everybody can play it. So now we all know the sport. The sport that is unique to Paralympics can be normalized inside 
of a just a, a K through eight school system. You can actually you can make teams doing this, right? Because everybody can wear the blacked out goggles, uh, and the kid that is visually impaired or blind in the school now gets a chance to be captain of the team, right? And so we can we can we can make those things. I I never subscribed to. I need to find a disability sports organization to to put my child into if I have a child with a disability and, and try to find a, a, a person, a coach that will coach a child with a disability. I've never subscribed to that because I never went through something like that. I always found the best coach possible to train me in whatever sport or discipline I was in. So that's what we have to do. We have to have parents and 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 children go into the school systems or go into whatever the if you're if you want to be a cyclist find your local cycling club and make sure that they are having these adaptive programs because coaches coach mm. it doesn't it doesn't take rocket science to do it right they they figure it out they they want a challenge and they're going to figure out how it takes to to train this this athlete to the highest level what happens i think oftentimes which holds us back is that we will say our doors and our programs are open to anybody that wants to walk in the door. High school programs, right? In. Well, the door is open for the coach's office, but who's walking through the door? No one, because they've never been asked to come. What we have to do is begin to change our mindset and look for, you know, when that that coach jumps out of his or her chair because they see the big six six kid coming in who can play basketball, or they see the the six three woman that can play volleyball and they're salivating at the mouth because they want them in the in the room. They have to see the same things in the value of the Paralympics as I see a kid with CP walking down the hallway and saying, "Oh my gosh, they could be the next greatest Paralympic athlete ever!" Right, and the, and I want to pull them and work with them in order to try to get them. Uh, down the road. And so that's the mindset shift that we have to happen. And that happens at, you know, the National High School Federation of Athletics and and all those to begin to build out the pervasive demand that I was talking about earlier to have these youth be identified at a level that they can they can elevate. Well, and I think, too, this is a great segue into another topic we wanted to cover tonight. And, and that was really, you know, how power and influence and status affect the, the larger ability to to grow. And, and in this conversation of disability um, and the disability experience, you know, parents, children, people need to be able to self-advocate and to seek out those opportunities and to stand up for, yes, I want the best coach, right? But we had all, we also need the support to come back the other way. And that yeah. coach to use their their position of influence and in, will use the, the school system, you know, to promote those opportunities and to put them out there. Um, and, and I know that's a more micro level example, but um, have you seen the need for that a- across the board? Yeah, I've, I've seen the need for yes. The 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 the, the, the answer short answer is yes. I, I think the deeper answer is okay. Why are we? What's what's going on with this whole power structure? Uh, and the the thing I was very <clears throat> um, what I did not understand about the disability community when I started kind of building programs was how tight knit the community was for each individual stovepipe that was a disability. So the blind have their thing, amputees have their thing, spinal cord have their thing, you know, dwarfism has their thing. So we got every every group has their own little pocket. And we had these five different um, um, organizations, right? We had that were that were running sport before Paralympics came came along and, and everybody kind of had to morph underneath uh, underneath that. And I found it really challenging to try to build anything because they, we got a little group, we got a little group. (laughs) And so it was, it was really frustrating because they were, they were in one community, no, no joke. In one community, there were three programs for three different groups of individuals, all having uh, groups and pulling the same talent for, for one Saturday of the month. Mm. I'm like, let's just, you take one Saturday, you take a Saturday, you take a Saturday. <laughs> now the kids get a chance to do three Saturdays and they all get a chance to have build community, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's that's just, wow, I don't have any hair right now because of that, right? So <laughs> it was it just didn't make sense to me. But here's, I think, the, the larger issue, Stasha, on 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 why that is, is because we, we start these little mom and pop shops uh, is what I saw. 
And so a child, a, a parent has a child with a disability. They don't find a, a community that's there together. So they start building one and they, they and that becomes the, the entity and the anchor. And then another parent in the same neighborhood has another child with a disability that's different. And they begin building something for them. And then that, and we get these stovepipes that begin stacking on top of each other. And, and when they and when we're starting to ask for support to build the program, that's what we're doing. We're asking, please support me. Please give me money. Please, you know, because we, we got these children here. We want them to have access to programs. And I think we got the model wrong. Hmm. I believe we got to shift the model to demand, not to give money, but I have value. And I'm going to insert my value wherever I think it, it, it's needed to, to uh, kind of usurp power. Because when we're talking power, power doesn't yield itself. It doesn't, doesn't give itself over. Very rarely does it give itself over. You have to take power. But those of us that have status, we want more power. So we're, 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 we're asking, would you please give me, give me, give me? And so the people in power just elevate our status. We're going to make the amputee group a little higher than the people with the wheelchairs. Oh, we're going to make the wheelchair users higher than people that are blind. We're just going to just going to, they just keep elevating the status of these groups and keep us fighting against each other. And I say, no, let's take the power. And so we got to, so that that's, and that's hard to do. It's a struggle. It's a fight because people in power don't want to give it up. They want to keep the, look at the NFL, right? <laughs> we all argue about the trades that are going on in, in Major League Baseball or or, 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 or Major League or, or in the National Football League, but who's got the power? It's the owners. But no one says anything about them at all. We just say, I can't believe so-and-so got paid that much money to run football. That <laughs> and so, because we don't, and, the, and, the, and, and, and the, if we take it and put that conversation into uh, the, the the normal person that's run, working a job, it's that person is earning enough revenue for the person that's in power to get paid and earn that salary. So that's the job. They're earning that that money. So we have to say, I have value and I'm going to earn this. I'm going to earn my spot. There's plenty of organizations that are out there that want to support youth with disabilities, that want to support cause relations, that are out there. Take take United States, uh, or, or not the just change the name, Disability In. Disability In is a is a group, a consortium, a nonprofit that houses all these top 250, 300 companies uh, uh, in the United States and global companies, you know, Southwest Airlines, United, uh, Accenture, EY, all these major companies, and they want to hire and retain and promote people with disabilities in the workplace. And you're telling me we can't go to those organizations and find some dollars to help build our programs? Are you kidding me? They have multi-billion dollar companies mm -hmm. and they want to support because they want the longevity of the relationship yeah. to have somebody work for them later on in their life. And so that's what I talk about taking the power. Don't think, think about, you know, going to your little local supermarket here or there. Yes, you can do that. But think about the big numbers that are really going to shift the program. We saw, and the reason I said it very rarely yields yield itself um, is because I saw in the Olympic Games an incident where power actually did give itself over. And I put it in this context yeah. because I had never seen it like this before. And that's with Brittany Bow and Aaron Jackson, speed skaters, 500 meters. And of course, Brittany Bow, white, brunette, uh, and Aaron Jackson, black. African American uh, speed skater, uh, Aaron Jackson, the, the world's number one speed skater, number one, one in Poland, first time ever, uh, and she's kind of bringing back, resurrecting Bonnie Blair, yay, Bonnie Blair, um, and uh, so she is the world's number one, and they're they're growing, right? They're 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 pushing out, but at the Olympic trials, world's number one, Aaron Jackson stumbles. Brittany Bow, who I think had already qualified in a thousand. Uh, wins the 500 meters. She realizes she's probably at best going to get 10th in the in the in the Olympic Games. So she says, "I need to give the power that was bequested by me because I earned it, and the prox and the um, and the privilege that I have to represent Team USA, and give it over to the person who I've had proximity to in training with her in Ocala, Florida." realizing she's num world's number one and she's got the best chance for America to win the medal. I'm going to give this over to Aaron Jackson, who then goes on to win the gold medal. And so that is power yielding itself because she could have really, she could have taken it. She could have said, you know, that's my, I earned the spot. I got it. 
And so in, bit, in the business community, this is what it looks like. You don't give your, your business over to your children. You give it over to the best person that can run the business to keep the business going. Hmm. And that's power yielding itself. But we don't do that. What we do is we kind of dumb it down because maybe our, maybe our child's the best person to run the business, but maybe not. And if we don't think they're the best person to run the business and we put them in there anyway, we just lower the standard. Hmm. And that's what we tend to do in our, in our Paralympics world. We begin to lower the standard because we don't reach out for the best of the best in the business. And so we have to begin to elevate that conversation and really yield itself, the, the power kind of yielding itself to who is the best person that can run this entity. And, and, and here's, how, here's what it looks like. U, USA um, uh, Hockey. Hmm. They said, we're going to invest yeah. in these Paralympians. And what have they what have they done? They've won four in a row. Gold medal, just beat Canada five nil. They used to be it used to be the a world's battle with Canada. Now they're crushing Canada. Right? So we got uh we're 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 coming up because these these NGBs, some of them are figuring it out. And they've opened themselves up, USA hockey, to more funding. Yep. Why? Because we just said. 15% of the world's population, 1.2 billion people have access and uh, can spend $8 trillion worth of money. And now USA Hockey has understood that I have access to greater wealth to build all my programs as well as the Paralympic program. But what do we usually do? Those in power say, oh, it's going to cost us too much. Those, those, those crippled kids are going to cost us too much. We can't, we can't, we can't be the NGB for them. So now the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee has to be the NGB because the other organizations won't take it on. And they're, and they're screaming, I don't know how we get more money. Hmm, let me think about that. Let's tap into 15 more percent and elevate. And so we don't think about it. So we, we just, because we, we can't get there because of how we treat people with disabilities in our country. Yeah. Well, and one thing that I've learned to appreciate about sport is that it, it is a great um, focus to be able to talk about something on a micro level, but the applications are so much more broad. And so I yes, appreciate yes. you being able to put this into the context of sport um, so that we can then apply it elsewhere. And yeah. and I, what I'm hearing you say, and it makes so much sense, is that, you know, working with, um, working for, creating opportunities that elevate the value of people with disabilities and really embrace the value that they uh, organically and innately bring to a community is the least riskful jump <laughs> we could make, right? Um, it, it should just be a no brainer, um, but it's not. And I think you just made a great statement that illustrates why. And that's because people, oh, it's too expensive. Oh, I, I it's just well, it's one. not feasible, right? It's not feasible. It's not going to make sense. We can't do it differently. Yeah. Um, what well, there's you... another reason too. Okay. So everybody knows Judy human out there. She's the mother of the, the independent living movement. Okay. Uh, dear friend of mine. And the first yeah. call I always make when I'm about to say something stupid, I call her first. <laughs> Judy's coming just... to Fort Wayne in the next year, by the way, putting a plug in for her. So <laughs> she's amazing. To have her be a speaker. Yep. Oh, that's awesome. You got to go hear her. She's brilliant. Um, and so she was on the Trevor Noah show. And as she's on the show, um, Trevor says, well, you know, Judy, you know, I, I think I'm from the able-bodied community. And, and Judy stops him and says, Trevor, well, you know, you're not really able-bodied. You're temporarily able-bodied. Yeah. And then Trevor Noah says, what are you, threatening me? <laughs> so it was kind of, and she thought about it. And she said, and we had a conversation about this. And I won't put words in her mouth. I'm just going to do the high level. She said, I think that's it, John. I think that's what it is, that people are afraid of having getting a disability so we don't want to lean into this moment because i might be able to see myself as that individual and i don't want to be that individual so if i if i acknowledge it then i have to acknowledge my own frailty mm. and that begins to say why after the the ada passes in 1990 that we have the curb cutouts that's okay we have airline transportation that's okay but I'm not going to hire somebody with a disability. That's not okay. Because I, I don't want to see myself yeah. in them. Yeah. Right. And so that begins. That's what we don't go now. So we're still at 70, over 70% 70 of people with disability don't get a job. And what happens when we talk about, let's bring it back to sport. 
So now our athletes that have competed on these world stages and they've been globally gone around the world and they're, they camp out at the U of I. They camp out to get these higher doctors at the University of Alabama because it's very difficult for them to get hired yeah. in the marketplace because of the way we think, the way we yeah. our mindset is against yeah. people with disabilities. Yeah. Well, and I think you, I think you, I think you hit it or Judy hit it. You know, it, it's, it's fear. It's fear. Yeah. And whether it's yeah. fear from a very, you know, in intrinsic perspective of, of self or whether it's fear of different um, there, there's so much of this um, ceiling that is yeah. built around fear. And, yeah. you know, back to your example, um, Aaron and Brittany from the Olympics and speed skating, there was no fear there between those two no. athletes because they knew each other so well that right. they understood that, in, it, to your example, yielding that power was going to be for the betterment of the entire team. A rising tide lifts right. all ships. But That's it's right. because they weren't afraid of each other because they'd been in proximity to each other and they understood who they were and the strengths they brought to Team USA. Right. Um, and, and I think if we can start breaking down those barriers of fear within our own communities, how much more successful can we be as a people? Right. I mean, and, and our, our companies, I mean, how much research is out there about when you when you hire diversity of all kinds, but when right. you hire diversity, your company will be more efficient and will be more successful. The research shows yeah. it over and over again. Right. Well, and it's purposeful proximity, right? Because we can be proximate and not and not together. Yeah. But yeah. but Brittany and them have purposeful proximity to it, one another. And I think when you talk about like the Accenture report that was put out in Q4 of 2018, we do see the data now in disability specifically that if you have company A that hires, retain, and promotes people with disabilities, company B that does not, company A actually outperforms company B two to one to shareholder returns. So the comptroller, Mike, uh, uh, Mr. Tom Dinopoli in New York State, says, I'm going to invest my over a trillion dollars of pension funds into company A versus company B. And he doesn't do it in Washington, D.C. or the DEI conference. He does it at the New York Stock Exchange. And you could have heard a pin drop in the room when he announced it, because now we're talking about real dollars of, that are going to programs that are elevating people with disabilities because they outperform the others. So I'm going to invest where the dollars are more valuable. And we have almost 100 CEOs that have, that have taken their companies, major top Fortune 100 companies that are, that, are, that, have measured, that are measuring themselves against the Disability Equality Index. So that's something that, that Disability Inputs out along with the American Association for People with Disabilities. And so we see the money is out there. There's no reason that we shouldn't be elevating our programs and having programs for our youth. Toyota, oh my gosh. The reason why we're on TV is because Toyota made the major massive investment. I mean, there are other sponsors too, but they made the commitment. They made, they, they really pushed on, um, you know, I think early on was like before all this happened was we media in the old days of 2000 when I was going through, they saw this early on. Toyota now has seen the same thing and they're pushing this conversation forward because let's face it. You don't get on television unless somebody has dollars to put you on TV. And if you don't have the ratings, when once you get on TV, no one wants to support you with their dollars any longer. But Toyota's making that investment. They and they've done it. They've done it well. Um, yeah. I, I, that's I'm I'm always impressed by how they are leading in a frontier that should not be a frontier, um, right. but yet it is. And and it's great to have a company showing one of the ways you can do it right. You know, they may not be perfect, I am sure, uh, but they are certainly doing some things right in, in that yep. context. Um, so if we, big picture things, lots of big picture things we've been able to touch on here, um, but if we bring it down to a um, personal community, hmm. how have you seen, uh, maybe even in your own life, you know, personal community done well? You know, that maybe communities that you're a part of, um, yep that that from a, a a micro level in your in your life have you have yeah, you seen I, yeah I, I think recently you know i'll just use an example here in colorado springs colorado we we are we're seeing this amazing museum that's happened for olympic and paralympic athletes and a community came together to build this together and at the onset of the building um they included people with disabilities 
in the in the construct of it. So uh, it's it's shaped. You, you kind of go you go down this kind of spiral. Um, it's not really a spiral, but you go, you go downward, right? But the original plan was to go up, and the and the folks that were our wheelchair users said uh, it's really hard to push up a hill, up a ramp the entire time. I'm really sweaty. Can we just go down? And they they redesigned it to go all to go down, right? So this is what happens when you bring people with disabilities to the forefront of conversations. You save a lot more money in your costs build outs. And if we can make things like an, an Olympic or Paralympic Museum with universal design in mind, that it, it, it encompasses the massive masses of people, uh, when you go, you can experience it at your own ability level, then we see more revenue can be gained because you're, you're, you're accessing all of those points. And people with disabilities, once they know that a place is friendly to them, they tell everybody. And it becomes a 7 to 10% multiplier on your own revenue. Yeah. I remember when I went on, a, on the macro le- on the micro level, we went to Torino and um, I took a group of kids uh, um, for the Paralympic experience. And we had, I don't know, about six, eight kids. I'm not sure. And we had their parents with us. We had like 12, our entourage, 12 to 15. Olympics are over with. Uh, and the, and the, the, the establishments are looking for people to come into establishments uh, to spend money. And I took my little visa card that I had with <laughs> with with the Olympic Olympic um, committee, and I went over to an establishment that I knew was not accessible, but they had seven years of preparation time to get ready for the Paralympic Games. But I knew their competitor across the street was, so I took my visa card up to there. Place was empty, no one there. And I said, "Hey, you got? Can you accommodate uh, us? We we got we have a uh, we have four wheel, people in wheelchairs. We have and and so." I, and we had, you know, two blind and whatever. <clears throat> um, and they started scrambling, trying to figure out how to get them into the building around the back. And also I said, oh, don't worry about it with my visa card flashing in hand. Uh, the, the, it seems like that establishment over there just just can accommodate us. They don't have to do anything. They don't have to make anything different. We're just going to go over there. Thank you very much. And I took my visa card in front of his face and walked across the street to a place that could accommodate us. And so we can vote that way, right? We able to vote. And so in our local communities, we can do the same thing. We can frequent the establishments that are most friendly to us and make a difference to have everybody else come. When you when we're doing uh, construction and the in the uh, and the build outs and the planning, the planning of cities. Why are we not at the at the table to say, I don't want two accessible rooms. I want the entire floor plan to be universally designed. Yep. So you don't have to th- even think about ADA. Let's let's think about that from the standpoint. So yep. now we just build out the concept and begin to in, 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 uh, um, have designers, builders come in and say, yeah, we, we can do that. We can just make that door wide. It doesn't, it's not going to cost us that much more money. It's, it's going to cost a whole lot, heck of a lot less, <laughs> you know, to, to do a, a retrofit yeah. later on. Um, I, I was just down in, in Orlando <laughs> and, you know, micro, right. And the, and the person asked me, uh, told me that they were out of, they were out of accessible. Well, they, I got the last accessible room. I said, why do I need an accessible room? I'm an amputee. You know, I can, I, you know, thank you very much for thinking about me, but I'd rather save that room for a person who has a disability that needs the accessible room. Right. Uh, that's just my, how my brain thinks right now. And so now what they want to do instead of instead of just honoring the person that might come in that might need that room b- more than I need it. <laughs> they want to put me on the like this this top floor and then charge me extra money for it. All right. What are you talking about? All your rooms should be. Equal. Uh, you shouldn't even be talking to me about accessibility. All your rooms. I, I should be able to walk in any room. Yeah. Whether I'm a, a person that doesn't need accessibility or a person that does, all your rooms should be like this. Right. Then I told him I was on the AAPD board of directors. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> hey, you have to do that. <laughs> you, use your just status, saying. John. Just use saying. Your status. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, that is a great example of easy ways for easy. Um, companies, business owners, you know, to make a dent in changing the way this world operates, you know, instead of assuming that your, you know, way of experiencing the world around you is the same way everyone experiences it. So if you can access X, Y, or Z, then, then it's good enough. Um, And then leave the exceptions for, you know, the extra budget or, or whatever it is. I mean, if you start at the beginning and say, I know that my experience is not the only experience. So let me create a space 
that is adaptable from the get go. Mm. It's not just for people with disabilities. I mean, right. people should do this because it's the right thing to do. But if you need to be selfish, there's so much, you know, economical benefit to serving the whole population and you're serving the elderly, you know, to your point, um, you know, about being temporarily abled. I mean, there's right. so many reasons why at some point in our, many of our lifetimes, we will need some sort of adaptation to the environment around us. And that should just be the default option. That's right. Like, so, that's what I, think. <laughs> the, I mean, the. You're 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 exactly right, and, the, and the, where, where you're going down this is like this little this little device here, right? We think that oh, I want to be turn my phone to silence in the movie theater, so I'm going to put the light flash on there, so I can see when a, a message comes, a text message comes through. Yeah. That wasn't designed for people who don't have hearing loss or maybe a you know a, a visual impairment that the, the phone now talks to you, right? That was done for people with disabilities, but we benefit from it. All of us do. So I can be in the movie theater, kind of. Oh my god, watch my text message, right? <laughs> and we can, we can do that, uh, and we can be under the table or looking down, trying to figure that stuff out. So we can send those communications in text, and, and so it, and then we, it goes to the abuse on the other side. So I, I'm as a, as a sports um, uh, announcer for track and field meets. I'm always telling the kids, don't bring your cell phones onto the infield because the rules say that. As a coach, I could actually text you on the field, and that's a violation. So that whole thing that was made out for people who had had hearing loss is now being used as a communication device for people to text each other. How many times we text each other a day? Mm. You know, that was done for, and so that's a universal design now that benefits everyone. And so we need yeah. to think about how we're going to do that from the from the outset. Great starting points for some people. I hope I hope some of our viewers are taking notes. Um, well, I do want to, if you don't mind, John, I, I'd yeah. love to be able to cover some questions that were submitted. Um, some of these are a little bit off topic, but I think they'll they'll still be fun to to roll with here. Um, and actually, this one I'll start with this one because this is a great segue. So, universal design, what we've been talking about for the last few minutes. In all of your travels, have you seen? a country or a community do universal design really, really well, but also regardless of universal design, what's been your favorite country you've traveled to? Oh my gosh. I don't know. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I think one of the interesting, what, what's countries done it well now that I've been to, I'm not sure. I'm, you know, I, there, there's, there's different levels mm -hmm. of, of things. So like, I, I just got like Abu Dhabi, um, I see some things that have done ex exceptionally well for those with disabilities, like the mosque. Uh, but then you get outside and you go to another place and the curve's like, you know, three feet high and, you, and there's no way to get up on top. Uh, so I think there are pockets of things that have, that happen, uh, when we're talking about, you know, the design of something here's, here's an, as an example I will give of universal design. I think that works well with people with disabilities leading the conversation, so when I was working for the United States Olympic Committee, we participated in a program called the Global Global Sport uh, Ambassador Program, I think it was something like that. Um, and we had a gentleman come over from Kazakhstan. His name is Yerlan Sumyanov, and he's an amputee above the knee amputee. And so Yerlan, one of the hardest workers I've ever seen. I mean, he's he's doing our program in the morning time. He's doing he's working his program at night, and uh, so he's not. I don't know how where this guy got his, any sleep. So uh, I take him to uh, the I take him to the, um, well, his project that he wants to do is he wants to build kind of a mini um, uh, training center that's li a livable inside training center after seeing the, the Olympic Committee's training center in Colorado Springs. Um, so he takes that concept, that's going to be his project, and he, he completes it in three years. But here's the interesting thing. Instead of him going to just the folks that were in Kazakhstan to help build this, this thing out, which they had some limited experience in, he comes back to the U.S. and goes to one of our Paralympic athletes who is a designer in this in the space. So, uh, Eliana Rodriguez. And so she has her degree in instructional and all, uh, in, uh, not instructional, in, in design uh, as an architect. Mm. And so she helps with the, with the concept from the outset of this universally beautifully designed building with fire escapes on the outside that people in wheelchairs don't have to wait for the fire department to come get them at the exit. 
while they, you know, while the fire is blazing and they don't know where they are, they can get out themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that is, I think, you know, what, what we're talking about when we are looking at it. So Kazakhstan has got some of these amazing things. The United States has some, some great places in, that, that I've been. I think some of the, 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 the rolling uh, campuses that I've seen around where there is no uh, lip to get into a, a hotel because the, the water runs off because they have a slight increase to get into the building. And it's, it's just seamless and the aesthetics are beautiful. And so we see this in a lot of these different cities that are, are around the United States even. Uh, so we have to look at, you know, how do we take the best of and put that at the, fore, the, the I think the forefront of all our builds, you know, around accessibility. Those are great examples. And yeah. what's your favorite country you visited? Oh, the favorite country. Uh, the next one, always the next one. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I, you know, I, really, I go back now, um, I, I, I really am enjoying the United Arab Emirates. Mm. <clears throat> um, I find I find it fascinating that in 50 years, Sheikh, Zay Sheikh uh, Zayed has has this this vision that he had 50 years ago is now dominating uh, in, in, you know, in, in today. Right. Yeah. So it's a huge travel destination. Um, it's, you know, the, the commerce that's there, the buildings going up. I mean, throw a rock and you got a new building that's going up. Uh, and then Abu Dhabi and, you know, Sharjah, uh, Ras al Haima, all these amazing little pockets and how they are investing into their youth, uh, into, you know, so it's not just the good old boys, good old girls network of, OK, you paid your dues and you get a chance to elevate. No, they're they're going they go down three levels. and They say, OK, who's who are the best people for this next role? And they groom three people for that that job. And then they the best one, they it, they go into the job. And so they, so there's no kind of dumbing down and just giving the keys over to somebody just because you know them. Yep. It's and I think that's fascinating because we don't we don't really do that very well here. And so now what happens? So what? So let's look at the the now we're seeing what's happened at the at the tail end of doing that. We're getting a very much aged population because everybody hired their buddies, and we don't have anybody backfilling. And so we're going to have this massive exodus with no talent to build to fill the gap. So how then, then what happens? We got to find the, the, the talent someplace else. So we go overseas and we find the talent to fill the gaps that we created ourselves. And that's, you know, that's that's what we have to think about. Can this new generation, our now generation, uh -huh. begin to really look down the, the line and say, I'm going to hire the best talent for the job, which might be a person with a disability, oh, God forbid, to be in this position. Why at all the top level um, communities that we have in the disability community, is there not a person with a disability that's leading it? Yeah. What's the pipeline? Right. Well, you, there, you hear, no, I'm sorry, John, keep going. Just go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I, you hear so many conversations around, you know, corporate tables saying, let's diversify our funding. Let's diversify our funding. Well, what if you diversify your hiring? Absolutely. And see where that takes you, you know, yeah. and, and especially with the conversation about workforce right now and the great resignation and, and just the, the challenge we have with hiring people. Um, you've got we have some solutions that are right in front there's of a, us. There's a talent pool that's right out there is really good that shows up on time, more present, uh, does more work, takes less breaks, less sick days. And it's right in front of your face right yeah. there. Um, yeah. Just you just got to you got to hire them. Yep. yep. OK, next question. And this is this is this is kind of a deep one, I think, potentially. Huh? But um, the question is, what change do you hope to see in your lifetime? As far as disability is concerned, it, or what change? Oh, Could yeah, you I, I think, on your heart. <laughs> I think I think we get away from. Uh, I did a TEDx talk on to, to, some um, beyond tolerance or something like that. It was it was I can't remember. Um, and I, I, I would like to see people, you know, beyond my lifetime to have their truth outweigh their fear. Mm. What I mean by that is that we talked a little bit about fears earlier. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily subscribe to just fears in general. I think there's some underlying things definitely that are driving the fears that we have to make us do some things. Because we can tell our fear is just a story that we're telling ourselves. But success also is a story as well, right? The opposite kind of fear in this conversation. And so I, I, 
once we understand the truth and we know this truth, we know to go this direction, what stops us from doing that? Hmm. Uh, and that I found have been at least two, has been at least two things. At least I'll, I'll share two things. And the first is other people. Other people believing for us what we can or cannot do, which is based upon what they believe they could or could not do if they were in our situation. And because we are so strapped to want to belong to a group, we won't go because of what we think they're, they're going to think about us if we choose to go that direction. So I might know to do the right thing, but I'm not going to do it because you, this group over here is, wants me, doesn't believe that, and I need to stay part of that group. So I'm too afraid to jump out on my own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then society is the other one. So I often will say, <laughs> when I was building the military sport program in, in San Antonio, uh, some, some of the, the people I worked with were burn um, survivors. So burned over 90% of their bodies. Faces melted, ears gone and stuff. And uh, amazing, amazing kids, soldiers. And uh, we say, thank you for your service, right? But when we, when we get... When they get home, after all their healing has happened, has taken place, they get to the best return state possible, and they're sitting across from their family and their children around the table with this different looking person. Every October 31st, we tell them as society, you're the nightmare on Elm Street. You're the one who's showing up in your children's dreams as a nightmare. Thank you for your service. And so what we have to do is begin to admonish Hollywood for always using, most part, 99% of the time, people with disabilities or people who are disfigured or people have a mental, uh, uh, some type of mental issue going on as the villains in the movies. Because what does that do? I go to the movies, I watch this, I see the Joker. He's, got a, he's obviously got some mental capacity things going on. But yet when we have a mental uh, health conversation, I can't get past what I've seen in that movie. So what I desire to see is that we are more responsible in how we are showing the breadth of society and not just talking about it, right? And going there and showing up with our money and saying, I'm not supporting that movie yeah. because you're you're adding to a narrative. And the then the and the and the when 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 it comes time what will happen is if you have a movie like the joker that gets a big blood they put all this money into it and going out there and if no one shows up to see it because of that hollywood would change hmm. they'll change because you're, you're voting yeah right you're voting you're saying uh oh wow we just put we just put 26 million dollars into this and we only made twelve thousand dollars what happened oh i see we don't we don't we don't need to be putting out people with disabilities as villains any longer. Yep. We'll, yeah, let's shift this narrative. Yep. Let's go back to the the drawing board and see how what we can change differently now. Yep. As a society making as that society. shift. You know, instead of waiting for media to make the shift for us. That's right. Yeah. This the pervasive demand that I talked about earlier. The pervasive demand is saying that this talent pool that we have needs to be enacted in some type of way to create this, this, this result. And the institution being impressed upon the change actually has to want to change. If Hollywood yeah. doesn't want to change it, they're not going to change it. But if the pervasive man says, I demand that you change it and I'm going to vote with my dollars, they'll change it. Yep. Yep. And that would be welcome to change. <laughs> That certainly would yeah. be welcome change. So I'm not saying that, you know, I don't I don't like some of the movies, right? I'm not saying that. I'm saying that if we do it over and over and over again, I can take it into my own narrative. Right. And people are talking about in, in, in professional speaking. They don't think I have, they don't think all the audiences I speak to, I'm trying to think of the last audience that was not. I can't think of one. I, I can think of one. In the past three years have primarily been white male. So what what is it that they, it's in their mind about me and how I show up in the news media, on in the movies, in any type of social interactions, and I get on stage and this is my group I'm speaking to. I got to not only win them over in seven seconds, but I got to put them at ease with mm. every single thing they've seen about me and my representation that the media puts forward in the newsreels. 
in the clips because blood leads the headlines. Mm -hmm. And we rarely see a positive story about a person of color. Yep. So so it, 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 it equates to that. So what I want to see is the, there's the ability to have us have our uh, commit to a jump, a hurdle of when our truth outweighs our fear. Well, I can jump on board with that hope, John, for <laughs> sure. With all of the opportunities we have for betterment, um, you know, moving into sort of wrapping up our conversation, which I have just enjoyed so much. And I feel like we could go, we could spend the whole evening together, which <laughs> maybe we should. We can just keep going. But what types of um, changes or um, efforts have you seen that encourage you within this conversation and this topic? Well, I, I've, I've seen also the, the best of humanity. I mean, oh my gosh, when, when I look, like I'll go back to Oksanam Masters, who I started off with, when I, I kind of talked about, you know, the duality of sport, but this kid is amazing. I mean, I just see what she's gone through and what she's persevered with, not just in sport, but the, the ability just to get to the start line and, you know, just her tenacity. And I, I really celebrate that and honor that because I know what that takes. And I know what, you know, some of the things that she has had to go through to, to push into some of these, these, these spaces. Um, and then the opportunities that I, th I think are on the table are the, the shifts that we're starting to see with normalization of disability through sport. I think sports an equalizer, and I think we have a lot that we can actually access, and that that encourages me. I look at the LA 2028, uh, 2028 games that are coming up, and what are the opportunities that we have on board right now that we can build runways to to have a, a t entirely different conversation. Uh, I, I think I think we have we're in the driver's seat for having a lot of stuff. I, I I hope that the Olympic Committee would begin to build the networks and build the pipelines that we can have a, a, a deeper level like uh, the, the NGB um, uh, uh, USA Hockey has done, what, like USA Triathlon is doing, to really embrace this group of, of talented athletes who are out there and say that, yeah, I, we, can, we can do this inside the school systems so that we can have some, some success in 2028. Um, you know, I, I think, like I said, it's, it's really good when the cherries are good, but, you know, we had two countries that were that win a lot of medals out of the winter games, and that eh, we didn't do as good as we thought we we're going to do over there uh, in, in in China. So we got to build pipelines. You know, yeah. we said it all the time. So I think there's opportunity there to build pipelines and and really uh, really get there so that we can once again dominate. Why is it that the United States builds the sports? Amy Purdy builds the snowboard sport, and yet now we're not winning snowboard. You know, not you know we're not winning those those medals. Um, I think we have to invest in in us. Like other countries, they find the sport. Oh, USA just did another sport. Let's put the dollars. Let's put the let's build the pipeline. Let's do it. Eight years later, they're kicking our butts, right? Because yep. we're not investing. We have to we have to make those investments. Yep. And and I think that um, we'll we'll learn that lesson one way or the other. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, I you know. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully on the easier side, right? Like let's let's learn it the easy way. Absolutely. Um, and just, yeah. We know it's what we need to be doing. So but that's an it's an opportunity. That's what I see. It. I see those as opportunities. Yeah. Uh, there's there's great potential. There's great increase because we have so many kids around our community that can be that, right? Yeah. They just need the pipeline to see it and go go get right. it. Right. Yeah. It precisely. They need the opportunity. Create right. that possibility. So for for those of our viewers that are thinking, wow, you know, I there's a lot to chew on here and, and so <laughs> many good things. What can I do tomorrow to make a difference in in this larger conversation? You know, what what takeaway do you want to leave um, with people who who just want to know they're doing their part um, and, and can act on it immediately? Yeah, I, I, I would offer it's it's your jump. You know, I often my keynote address is it's the kind of the biggest thing. You have to make the commitment to it. And whatever that means in your space, in your world, just just do that. All right. You don't have to you don't have to create something huge. 
Uh, maybe it's knocking the door down for somebody that, that needs the opportunity, uh, advocating for that individual, uh, speaking up for somebody. Uh, when you're in a meeting, if no one's even there and you know something is is not looking right, be the be the voice that begins to in, 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 interject into the um, into the conversation, because that's how it's going to begin to shift and change. Uh, when people start pushing you out of the meetings, you know you're doing something right. Right. You're making people uncomfortable and that's OK. Right. So you, you, you got to be the voice at the table to advocate for the, the community, <clears throat> because a lot of times the community is not part of the, uh, you know, with, with the, with the Hamilton in the room where it happens, the room <laughs> where it happens. But uh, why why does there even need to be a room? Why can't the doors be off the room? Why can't we all be a part of the, the conversation? I think that's what we have to do is begin to knock those doors down, open the doors up wide. Uh, to, to have the, the full conversations because we see time and again that when we do that, everybody wins. Absolutely. Well, that is a great closing closing comment, John. Um, but I will give you one opportunity. Is there anything else you want to add um, for the sake of the conversation tonight? Uh, yeah, I think, well, what, what, what would I say? I, I would, I, like I said earlier, I said, I used to hate the word inspiration. Now I embrace it. I, I took that on very early when I had a, a specific incident that happened to me in, in the year 2000. I won't go into the story. Um, but now I see inspiration as the catalyst to motivation. Motivation in turn causes actions. Actions lead us to transformational results and those results, they re-inspire us or they allow other people that are watching the process to catch the vision. The mantra I always talk about with JR and you know JR and and the um and Inspire Communications International is to go forth inspire your world. So our, we're we're to, we're all about in our vision is to inspire worlds, not the world, inspire worlds, the, in, the what we have influence over. So go becomes the command. Forth is your direction, inspire is your vocation. Your, because only you can do this work, and world, it's your sphere of influence. So go forth and inspire your world, and hopefully we'll talk to you next time, and we'll turn it back over to the amazing Stasha. <laughs> well, I could not have asked for a better wrap-up. That, um, I think, is the perfect takeaway for us to be able to move forward. And and in the spirit of our First People Conversations um, series, that's, that's what we want to have happen is, you know, having people and, and starting with yourself um, have conversations that are in front of you. Um, be a part of those conversations, inject insight and perspective and questions into those conversations um, and see people for who they offer themselves to be, not who you assume they are. Um, so thank you all again for joining us tonight. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, we will have this recording available. Um, so I I hope that um, if you weren't able to catch this live, you're able to catch it later. We will also have links to all of our other featured conversations with Tom, Lisa, Cliff, and Tina that we featured throughout the month. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Turnstone, uh, turnstone at turnstone.org. We'd be happy to field those emails. Um, myself and my team are the ones that get them. So we'll be on the receiving end. Um, and then you can visit our campaign recap with all of our stories at turnstone.org slash first people. So we we will see you on the other side and everyone um, have a great evening and make it a great week. Thank you all.